Okay, uh, Candy, thank you so much. I'm not sure if I'm really in any kind of position to tell anyone uh, what they should be doing, but um, I can certainly share um, my research experiences of doing social media research um, for the last sort of eight years. Um, I, as Candy said, I teach um, media and communication, and a lot of my teaching is uh, methods teaching, and in the last few years has, has solely focused on social media methods. And um, in terms of kind of my background, um, I have an unorthodox media studies background in the sense that I did my PhD in a history of art and design department. So I'm an unusual media scholar in that I like images and I think images are really important and there isn't enough research on social media that also incorporates uh, the visual and I think this is um, really important. Uh, my key focus is on crisis communication and since 2005 in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina I became really interested in um, data that was cropping up left, right and centre on social media, on Yahoo News, you may remember the uh, controversy about black people who loot and white people who apparently just find things. Um, and I was interested in uh, Wikipedia and Wiki News and the way in which citizen journalists could um, kind of challenge received wisdoms, particularly around rumours um, in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina, particularly to do with the criminality of African Americans. Um, so, since 2005, um, I, I was sort of seen as an, an odd person doing this um, until in 2008 I met Mike Thurwell um, and my interest in sort of what increasingly became big data was seen as less strange. Um, and since then Mike and I have worked um, closely on a number of projects and we're now um, completing uh, a book on researching um, social media. <clears throat> So what I want to talk about today is this kind of thorny issue of ethics and really what I, what I hope we can do is have a discussion around this. So I just have some really bare minimal slides, um, just some nice white Helvetica on a black background that I, I hope can stimulate some dis debate and discussion. Um, and I really want to start with this um, idea, do I need ethics approval for that? Uh, and this is the thing that my students constantly ask me. So I'm supervising uh, a lot of uh, media um, students at the moment. They're all interested in social media data. And this is the, the, the key question that they always ask me. And I ask myself about the data that I look at. Um, do I need ethics approval for that? Uh, and just as a kind of um, issue of sort of transparency, uh, the man in the, in the image is my boyfriend. And he, he did give uh, consent for being shown here so publicly. So one of the things that I think is, is interesting is the current phase we're in that could almost be seen as a sort of second land grab for the internet in terms of the people who are involved, the terms of issues around governmentality of the internet, what kind of space this is, what kind of methods do we need. And so I think in this kind of land grab metaphor, I'm, I've been really interested in some of the language that has been mobilized in relation to that, the Wild West. Um, so one of the things that I come across a lot as someone who does a lot of stuff around open data and data journalism as well is this concept of big data as this new frontier, this wild west, this untapped resource. Uh, you know, you, you can't uh, kind of get past this idea of data, big data as the new oil, open data as the new oil and the value that has to be and can be extracted from that. And I think in, the, in recent days um, with Facebook kind of going on the stock market, there are some question marks about how valuable this data um, really is and how we can extract value from it. And I've been interested in, in these terms, data wranglers. I mean, you don't kind of get more Wild West than, you know, ideas of wrangling. So people who have the skills to wrangle and, and you know, kind of tame this wild beast of data. Um, references to snake oil and charlatans who are peddling their wares in terms of social media and tools we might need and, uh, and so on. So I think there's some very interesting kind of meta discourses that are floating around at the moment that um, I haven't heard anyone mention today, but I think they're really worth mentioning. And I think we, we are part of a larger framing in that sense. So in terms of, my, in terms of my, own, my own work, I sort of started in the top left corner with fairly small manageable data, and now I'm, I'm in the big unstructured data. And I think it's worth sort of, for me, reflecting on what's happened in those eight years. I've really gone from something that was very manageable and I could do on my own to something that is increasingly difficult to do on my own, and so computer scientists have really kind of become my best friends. I also think 
what, happens, what has happened in that moment is that quantitative and qualitative research is coming much closer because of the necessity to kind of overcome some of these issues and the clashes that are, I think, being brought into view by the kinds of work we want to do. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll say something more, more about that. Now, the issue around public data in terms of ethics, I think, is, is sort of an absolute kind of key issue that um, has already been mentioned by, uh, by Mike and, and also by Helen, and it's worth, I think, unpacking that a little bit um, further. Um, I think publicness has got a lot to do with the idea of thinking of this sort of social space in an offline context and how do we think about a public space and what kind of ethics are needed if we capture data in what we think is this, is this public space. And so, so I think the, the issue of access to this data is a really crucial element in thinking through potential ethical implications of what we then do with that data. I also think one of the crucial elements within the debate is about visibility. So someone like Dana Boyd, who's spoken about social stenography um, in terms of how teenagers use Facebook, that you're sort of hiding in plain sight, that you understand privacy in such a way that you talk in public, but in such a way that only a small group of people really understand what you're talking about. So I think this concept of social stenography is really interesting, and the ways in which people imagine themselves in these spaces. Um, and imagine their visibility in these spaces. And I think where ethics really com comes up against this idea of public data or publicness is when we make people very visible. If you're using Twitter, yes, you are using it on a platform that is public, but most of the time you're using it in a way that doesn't imagine that there's people with big trawlers like me hoovering up all this data to be analyzed and picked over later. So it's this tension with visibility and publicness and the scale and who sees, um, who sees these messages. Now, from Helen's presentation, in a way, and if we go back, back further, before issues around um, blogging, there is nothing new about this in terms of thinking about ethics, in terms of thinking about how people uh, imagine their, their uh, data might, might be used. But I think it's uh, worth flagging up again this idea if people are being seen as authors in, in terms of then thinking about do, do, we need, you know, do we need to contact them or can we just use this sort of, you know, do we see them as subjects and we can just take this content and we don't need to um, further um, think about this. And I also think specifically in relation to Twitter, which I will talk about most, the idea of ephemerality is really important. And I think the idea of ephemerality hasn't been mentioned so much, but there is something about having conversations in public, may that be IRL in real life or on Twitter, and feeling that they're just going to disappear. And that there isn't a data sift that now can go back to January 2010 and basically sell your ephemeral tweets to the highest bidder. So I think the idea of ephemerality is really, really important in terms of how we think through um, what is going on on, on these platforms. Now, um, as, as um, uh, this is sort of an interactive session. I mean, are there any additional things that people feel are really important to kind of um, add to this idea of publicness? So Mike sort of outlined his position on, on how you can use public data if you decide it is public and then the steps you take, which is basically, okay, it is public data, but you then have to anonymize because you have to then take further steps to deal with this data in, in a sensitive way. I mean, are there any additional positions that, that people want to kind of throw out there? Hmm. 
I think the, the um, idea for the sort of data intermediary is a really good point, and I will sort of mention that in relation to Twitter, because they really, although Twitter says, you own your data, it's like we like to sell it. Um, so in terms of who owns what, I think that's a really, a really um, interesting point that I will pick up on. Um, now, I think the other thing in terms of new guidelines, I think uh, an event like today's really highlights that thinking about ethics in relation to social media is really now percolating through, uh, you know, ethics uh, committees um, at various universities. And one of the one of the things that I think will be very interesting to see in in the coming years is whether or not ethics committees will move away from a light touch approach in terms of internet data and decide, no, actually, we have to go further than a simple light touch approach, and we can't simply say this is public. So I think there are implications for the ways in which ethical frameworks at university level and the ways in which funding councils also might become more nervous or more cautious. Uh, we might see lawsuits, who knows, in terms of the use of this data. So I think that there is certainly um, a, a much larger framework within which we all exist that may limit or may start to frame more strongly the ways in which we can do this research. And I think that's, again, a very important point uh, not to underestimate. Now, one of the things that um, I find really useful in, uh, in my teaching, but also in kind of giving workshops and, and presentations on this material, is to kind of reflect on my own work and reflect on the various projects that I've been involved in and particularly for, for this talk on the ethics, which always comes up. And I'm really glad that it always comes up because that's the only way in which I feel I can become a better researcher by essentially sort of having these intellectual sparring matches um, with people and people putting forward their position and, and, and me having to really defend why, why certain choices were made or why they weren't made. I think that's incredibly healthy. So um, I want to kind of discuss two uh, examples one is a project that um, I worked on uh, in 2009, uh, starting in 2009, which looked at a video uploaded by a Dutch right-wing MP, Geert Wilders, who um, uh, since then has kind of only risen to further prominence. And he uh, uploaded a very anti-Islamic um, film on the internet, which then uh, got lots and lots of responses on YouTube. Um, and I was the researcher on that project. And one of the things that was an assumption uh, was that the data would be easy to capture and we could have this data set and then, you know, we were off. Um, and I thought, uh, well, no, this is going to be very difficult because YouTube is incredibly slippery, things change all the time, and what are the tools through which you're, um, you're going to do this? So as you, as you may have, uh, the eagle-eyed uh, people in the audience may have spotted, Mike Thurwell became an honorary member of the research team because he built a tool based on the YouTube API that allows you to take a snapshot of uh, YouTube, which the API is the application program in interface, which allows you to communicate with essentially the digital version of YouTube, which gets you access to registration information, and it allows you the top 1,000 uh, videos results and the top 1,000 comments. And what I want to um, briefly reflect on is a network analysis that we did on the different people who had uploaded uh, response videos. So what we were interested in looking at, and we applied lots of different methods, which is also um, worth saying in a, in a uh, kind of context like this, this is a project that applied, I think, about six different methods to the same data set. And I think that doesn't happen often enough, that you recognize where the limitations of one method uh, begins, and you say, OK, this is taking us so far content analysis. Now we're going to look at the networks. The networks are only taking us so far. Now we're going to do interviews. The interviews are only going to take us so far. Now we're going to uh, understand better how genres develop on YouTube, um, and so on. So we did a whole bunch of different things with the same data. and I think as a cluster of about, I think, seven uh, articles now, I think it's a very interesting body of work that, that sort of shows the potential um, for these different methods. But in terms of ethics, we produced this network analysis based uh, using a webometric analyst, Mike, uh, Mike Thurwell's uh, tool, which uh, does lots of, uh, deals with lots of different social media. 
And what we were interested in is who had subscribed to whom on YouTube. So there's different ways in which you can build these networks uh, based on comments, based on subscriptions. Uh, so Mike talks a lot about comments um, and also based on, on friendships. Now, in terms of social media data, friendships are reciprocal. So I have to agree that I know you and you're my friend, whereas subscriptions are, uh, are not necessarily. So this is the same way in Twitter that you can follow someone, but they don't necessarily have to follow you back. So this is the subscription network. And what we started to see was quite a large cluster of what, what we um, recognized to be people in favor of Islam, and they were often Muslims. And as we were going through the um, process of getting this published, at some point, it was the issue of anonymity was raised. And, and we went, oh, yes. Um, is it OK to publish it like this? And we had lots of discussions about whether or not it was. And in the end, we decided that it wasn't. Because what these networks show, and so what the published version <laughs> looks like this, it's simply the notes and the, the labels we gave to these networks that we recognize. So we have a pro-Islam network. We have a pro-Wilders network and various smaller networks. And what we say in the article is that the ways in which this data makes connections and shows connections um, through channel names, which often can link back to an individual, that means that it's important to us to anonymize that data, particularly on a topic as sensitive as religion, a topic that is about debates on Islam uh, and very inflamed debates uh, on Islam. And so uh, this, this paper was published in uh, New Media Society, and we talk about uh, semi-public data there. So, and the reason we talk about semi-public data is because I think, and this is something I'm working on further uh, with my colleague Natasha Whiteman, is the role of the API. And I don't think we think critically enough about the devices through which we harvest the data. Um, the, the, the data, uh, the, the devices have no ethics. We are the ones who have the, the ethical kind of um, guidance. And, and I think what's really interesting is when we did the YouTube project is that we started off um, with this idea, it's public data. It's just out there on YouTube. We can harvest it. But what became very difficult is when you're interested in something like Islam and you're interested in gender, how can you, on the clues of the channel page, figure out if this is a man or a woman posting? You very quickly, trying to do this manually, you very quickly run into trouble, and there is no reliability. What does a woman look like on YouTube if she doesn't actively say, I'm a woman? I, I don't know. Um, and so these, these issues were, were real issues. I, I blogged the project for a year, and if you're interested, you can go on the project um, blog and sort of um, feel my despair at various points trying to grapple with this data, but the API makes a difference in the sense that this gives you access to the registration information, which you cannot see through the web interface. And that's really worth um, thinking about what difference does that make in terms of ethics. So you have the web interface, the way in which you can see the YouTube channel, you can see information about the poster, but that doesn't necessarily give you all the data that is there behind the scenes in the API. Once you get access to that through one of these tools, what are the ethical implications of that? And that's why we purposefully called it semi-public data, because we were going in through a way that revealed more than that was visibly um, evident. So I think that's really worth thinking about. And in teaching this stuff to my students, um, I, can, I can only speak from a position of the, the, the deepest pride uh, that my students who recently had to review 12 different uh, tools for um, scraping and uh, collecting data from different social media platforms started doing uh, demonstrations of ethical walkthroughs, how you can walk through this data ethically and anonymize. So I had an amazing presentation of uh, both Gephi and Node Excel, which is uh, data or which are um, uh, software packages for doing uh, network analysis. And what the students were doing was actually showing this is what you can do, but do it ethically by anonymizing it in these ways. And this is how you, how you do it. So I think the ethics of the device, just because the device can, doesn't mean you have to. And I think that's a really um, key thing that I've, I've taken away from, from teaching that this year. So I want to say something about the Reading the Riots project um, as well. And again, reflect on that and um, 
Robert's already sort of given you a, a, you know, a very thorough um, summary of, of the project. So I want to kind of talk about the ethics of it. So the um, rumor visualization um, kind of went viral. So I, I um, witnessed with um, great interest on the Reading the Rights hashtag uh, that it was, I think by now it's been sort of shared over 6,000 times um, across lots of different social media platforms. So it's sort of 6,000 times on Twitter and uh, lots on Facebook as well. So this, this thing really created a buzz. And because I'm also part of an open data, data journalism uh, kind of community, this was the visualization that um, you know, people have been talking about since, since it went live um, in December. And one of the things that um, I've been discussing ever since it went live is the ethics of it. Um, and I think what's very interesting is that a number of people have blogged about the ethics and have questioned uh, and have engaged in heated Twitter debates with me um, about the ethics um, of the ways in which the data is displayed in the visualization. And one of the things I think that's really interesting about this is that in the end, the Guardian made a decision to include the Twitter handles of people and also um, show the whole tweet. So this is part of the storytelling device that, that it gives the story, I guess, more of, of a of feeling that there are human elements in it rather than simply showing the dots that, that move and have different colors. It actually shows who are the people who did the tweeting. And this was the thing that was really being questioned a lot. Did you ask people for consent? Um, how did you do this? Why did you do it like this? Are the people okay with this? And um, so as a, as a social media researcher and as someone who's very active on Twitter, it was a kind of weird meta experience for me because a lot of the people in the corpus were my friends. So a lot of the people who were very actively tweeting the riots were my friends. I was in the corpus as well, which was kind of strange. Um, and, and so I think what's, what's interesting is the kind of small furore that exploded around that visualization in terms, in terms of ethics. And I think where that leaves us <clears throat> is to think about maybe why that happened. And so one of the things that I've recently started thinking about, as you do, is Twitter data as sunflower seeds. Um, one of the ways in which Twitter is positioning itself as a company, uh, Di Costello gave uh, a talk at Wired uh, Business Conference about a month ago, is this new slogan, Twitter brings you closer. And the way, through, uh, the way in which he explained that was through uh, Ai Weiwei's installation in the turbine hall, um, where Ai Weiwei had this, you know, the turbine hall filled with ceramic sculptures, which were essentially little sunflower seeds, which had been handmade and hand painted and carefully crafted and were individual objects. And what Costello was explaining was, and, and also Ai Weiwei at the time explained, was that this was a really useful way to think about Twitter, that you have this mass of things and you can't really see what's going on, but then when you pick, pick it up and look closer, in the case of Ai Weiwei, you see carefully sculpted little uh, sculptures, and in the case of Twitter, you see individual, individual tweets. So what I started thinking about is we need to talk a lot more about little data. So this is a kind of uh, something that I've been talking about in the last few months. Seeing the little data and the big data up close is, I think, one of the, the reasons why I think a lot of debates around ethics are in this kind of meeting space where big data quant methods meet more qualitative methods. And I think the data visualization is a really good example of that, that you have 2.6 million tweets, but you visualize only a few thousand and you do very careful analysis of a few thousand but you pull those out of an enormous or as Rob said not such an enormous data set but you pull that out of something much larger and the individual is being is being revealed. Um, I want to close by saying um, that it's obvious that a lot of people are working with social media data now and I think this is very much blurring the boundaries the fact that there was um, someone presenting you know from a marketing perspective perspective I think is really important and I think we can learn a lot from people outside of academia. I'm certainly learning a lot from uh, working with journalists and working with, uh, with NGOs and activists. But I think that also raises a number of, of points that um, I think I, I sort of, you know, this is where I guess I'll really throw open the, the discussion. 
is the ethics of the different stakeholders that might be involved in these projects. And so I think one of the things that was very interesting about reading the Riots project is that you have three different stakeholders who have very different ideas about ethics. Um, so you have a, a company that's very much interested in, in data ownership and what happens to that data and that data not being shared. You have a newspaper that is much more concerned about issues of, you know, that, that might affect them legally. And you have academics who are saying, but we must, we must mask these tweets, we must protect the participants, and so on. And then what kind of comes out of that in the middle is, is something that I think from an academic perspective, um, one may not be wholly comfortable with. Um, and I, so I think as the, the kind of the, the, the Wild West rolls on in terms of research on big data and social media data, I think we will increasingly see these partnerships where uh, these big data projects are being sponsored by, you know, companies like Google. Where do things like conflict of interest come into that? Um, and, and I think these things are really um, worth exploring. And how does that influence our, our research? Uh, in terms of access to data, I think this is a really uh, interesting point. When the, uh, the data was, um, or when the publications and The Guardian came out, uh, again, I was asked immediately on Twitter by lots of different people, okay, give us the data. Where is the data? Can we see the data? Oh, you're the only one who has access to the data. Well, lucky you. You know, so this idea around privilege and having an interactive team behind you, I think is really worth thinking about very critically and what kind of gaps that may open up in terms of who does this kind of research and how and who doesn't. Um, and this data can't be shared most of the time. This is a corpus we can't share. I think that's a problem because this is a really, really valuable corpus in terms of further understanding um, how people engage with the riots on Twitter. Uh, but there's an issue of, of, of sharing this data, which I think is very problematic. Um, and also goes against recent trends in, in the academy that, that basically say, you will only get this money if you then deposit your data. Right? So the reuse of data is a very, very big uh, trend of the last five years. We can't do that with a lot of this data. So where does that leave a lot of this research? Uh, also in terms, of, you know, in terms of ethics. And so I think what I want to understand better is what are our roles and responsibilities in, in terms of that. Um, so I think the ethics of the bigger research community in asking these tough questions that I've been asking myself um, ever since you know, I've been doing this research, and I think lastly is how do social media users themselves perceive these concepts and issues? So issues around privacy are, are often um, invoked. And so I think the work of someone like Dana Boyd is really important here because she goes off and does an ethnography and understands better how teenagers are dealing with these issues of privacy. We don't know how, Twitter pe uh, how people on Twitter think about these issues, and I think we ought to try and find out. So I think there's a lot of assumptions that um, consent is a really important concept. So this is one of the key things that was critiqued about the data visualization. Did you get consent? Consent, consent, consent was the key thing. Um, whereas, is that really the most important thing to talk about? I, I have a feeling that there's other things um, that we need to add to that mix. Um, one of the things that I was shocked by, for example, in, in terms of that um, visualization, is that some people on the Reading the Rights hashtag were celebrating that they'd started rumors. Where's the ethics in, in thinking about what you put out there again in terms of people realizing that they've started something. So in terms of the motivation, um, I, I think we don't know why a lot of people started these rumors. And I think if we hadn't told them that they'd started them, they wouldn't have found out. They wouldn't know. So it's really easy retrospectively to say, oh, here's the visualization. This is how the rumor unfolded. I, I will put my hand in the fire and, and really commit to saying these people did not necessarily think they were starting rumors. They were just tweeting things that then were put in a context and people were pulled out of that context and highlighted as having done something. And I think there's, a, there's an ethical issue there as well to think about what, what that then does when you feed that back into the Twitter community. Um, so that's me. And um, the book has got a, a website, Researching Social Media. And also, if people are interested, I'm starting a new job at the University of Sheffield in September where I'll be um, running a social media surgery every month. Um, and that has a WordPress. So thank you.
exciting. We've thrown okay. lots and lots of questions for us to think about to network together. Um, I think we've probably got time for one or two questions if anyone else. Uh, Lynn Pettinger from the University of Essex. I really like your comment about API devices, and I'd like that sort of idea to be taken much further. That all kinds of tools and techniques and software cultures and infrastructures need to be thought of not as purely neutral as things that we mm. can, facilitate, can facilitate our mm. work, but as things that constrain and make particular mm. avoidances possible. Um, and because of that, I think, don't think you're right to say that these are ethically neutral tools necessarily, but I think that sort of takes yeah. you away from some of the discussion. Mm. I think there'd be a big question to ask yeah. about what kind of ethics they might make possible or mm. not possible. No, I think, I, I mean, I didn't explicitly say that they were neutral, but I didn't, I guess they don't necessarily take an ethical position as a tool. Um, but I think the makers of the tools can think more, not necessarily about uh, per se making the tools more ethical and, rest and, and restricting the abilities of the tools, but maybe when, when they you know, upload tutorials or in the documentation of the tools to actually flag this up. If you would like to anonymize or if you'd like to do these things, these are the ways in which you can do that. So that, that the debate filters down more to the level of the tool. And I think you know, we can do a lot more with that. And that's why I was really um, taken aback that my students took it upon themselves to sort of do these anonymized walkthroughs of data with, with in their recent presentations. Was up. Um, I think APIs have ethics or, or at least um, some or normativities. Mm -hmm. um, just a short example, like for example, um, Facebook, I mean if you what you see on screen is more than what you get via the API, for example. Mm -hmm. I mean, so that's a sort of like thought, mm -hmm. it's, it's thought about. Through the API, you can't query, sort of batch query your friends' religions. Mm -hmm. It's blocked. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, I mean, I mean I, 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 it's interesting to actually, mm -hmm. actually study the, 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 sort of the normativities of the APIs and, and yeah. instead of thinking or, or perhaps giving some people the impression that that the developer's view mm. is really, uh, you know, that they get more and it's vast and there's lots of data there and then the user's view yeah. is, is, is less, it could be the other way around as in Facebook. I think that's a really, really important point. I think um, you've opened the can of worm that is Facebook um, in terms of privacy issues. So, I, I mean, one of the things that, of course, I didn't go into is the ethics and, and so on of the companies themselves. And, and that I think Facebook collects, I think it's 57, for, uh, 57 markers per user in terms of, you know, um, so, you know, there's issues with that. And, of course, there's the Europe versus Facebook kind of ongoing case, um, you know, the, the, the legal case. But I think, I think your point about mapping what these APIs have access to um, and, and how we can think about that, I think, is really, I think is a really valid one and a really important one. So not just in terms of what is the difference between the API and the web interface, for example, but also the way in which the company gives you access to the API and the way in which the company gives you access only to so much um, and what is going on there. And then, of course, then there's all the, the third, you know, third party um, software builders as well. So I, 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 I think that's a really valid point and a really important one as well. So what I was sort of trying to do is to drill down much deeper to the level of essentially software studies, which is, I think, where some of this really needs to go. Thank you, thanks, thanks a lot. Okay, so next up um, to the podium are, and I'm going to have to read this or else I'll get somebody's name wrong, uh, Malcolm Williams, William Housley and Adam Edwards from Cardiff Online Social Media Observatory. And they're going to be talking to us about social media and data mining and the issues about quality and quantity. So we'll welcome them up here. Just to get your, sorry. Well, thanks very much, Candy, um, and thanks very much for the invite to the network today. It's been some fascinating talks, and uh, it's really good to be here, so thank you. My name is William Housley. I'm here with my uh, colleagues, actually my boss, uh, <laughs> Professor Malcolm Williams, Director of the Cardiff School of Social Science, Sciences, and my colleague, uh, Adam Edwards. Um, 
what we want to do today is actually discuss and reflect some of the methodological